Dementia manifests a wide range of symptoms from terrifying memory loss to cognitive impairment that can make day-to-day -day functioning nearly impossible. It makes care for patients a particular challenge. A new approach, however, is showing some promising results. Let's find out more from Dr. David Sheard. He's the founder of the Dementia Care Consultancy, Dementia Care Matters. And we're delighted to welcome you to this side of the pond. Yeah, great to be here. As people will hear from the accent, you're not from around these parts. No. That's great. Great to have you here. Before you pioneered the kind of dementia care that we're going to talk about in a second, uh, you almost left the field, I'm told, after 14 years of working in it. Yeah, I'd, I'd worked in Britain in the NHS and social services mm -hmm. for 14 years since I was 22. And I tried to deliver the sort of dementia care that was out there. But it was sterile, clinical, empty. Mounds of boredom, people lethargic, staring into space, and what I call chemically coshed. And I call what? chemically coshed, in other words, given antipsychotics, oh. sedatives, in, re in response to behaviours. And as I arrived home with the words, I've resigned, I'm out of it, I can't run warehouses anymore. Hmm. But something clearly changed because you've pioneered this thing called the butterfly method. What's that all about? Yeah, it began 23 years ago, mm -hmm. and obviously it's now spread to five countries. Uh, it's a belief that really the whole of long-term care is based on something that was called by Professor Tom Kitwood originally, a malignant social psychology. In other words, we've created the them and us culture, and we've put it all onto people with dementia. They're the ones that have the symptoms, the causes of dementia, the behaviours, and we're the ones that then deliver this very passive, separated care. Whereas the butterfly model is about a butterfly starts off brown, dry, like a chrysalis. Dare I say, many long-term care homes are brown. Mm. Uh, brown seems to proliferate not only in the colour of the walls, but in the attitude. Mm. Whereas what we're trying to say is staff can turn themselves into butterflies, they can transform long-term care. And being a butterfly is an analogy for workers being colourful, flitting, creating the moment, being still, and really reaching people living with dementia. So give us an example. How would, how would care be different under the butterfly model? So let's take an example here of the butterfly home in uh, Ontario, which was at the region of Peel. You don't want to miss a saga. It's uh, yeah. 40 minutes from here. Malton Village. Mm -hmm. So there they have uh, a lawyer. Uh, and a lawyer who had taken to his bedroom and become very, very introverted. Uh, and they decided to uh, contact the legal department. They created a lawyer's kit for him. Uh, they got him reading the Human Rights Act. They have him now sitting out at a desk and asking him about his legal case. And he's come alive. The, the dementia is still getting worse. It's a degenerative condition. But the whole basis of the butterfly movement is if you reach the person's spirit inside, you, the person with dementia can come alive in their spirit. And the, but it means crossing the bridge into their reality. How do... OK, which means that when they say things that are wrong, you don't correct them all the time. That's part no, of it, right? Not at all. No. In my first 14 years, I was... You know, they often say six things. Wherever I go around the world, mum, dad, kids, school, work and home. My mum will be coming soon for me, won't she, when they're 93. In a minute, I shall have to pick up the children from school. I want to go home, I want to go home. And I used to think they wanted those literal things. Mm. But there is a language of dementia, and you need to learn that the language isn't literal, it's a language about metaphor and feeling. So when someone's saying, uh, my mum will be coming for me, won't she, what they're really saying behind those words is, I got up this morning with Alzheimer's in my brain and I'm not going to get through the day. And because I can't get through the day, I need my mum. Why am I in a place that's not loving me like my mum? Why aren't you like my mum? So instead of responding by saying, you're 90, your mother's not coming, the butterfly model suggests what? The, the butterfly model, you would say, you loved your mum a lot, didn't you? She used to be a school cleaner and she worked really hard and she had six children. And you'd start talking about mum, you'd start talking about her life with mum, and then you'd very subtly and cleverly move it on to you being like her mum and getting her to do things with you and saying, come on, you know, your mum needs to do washing up, we, we better start washing up too together. I really need you. In other words, you transfer the feelings. That is a massive revelation in how to provide different care. How did that occur to you? It occurred because when you start to think about anybody who's vulnerable and stop thinking this about dementia and start to think this is a person who's seeking comfort, who's seeking security, who's seeking a sense of belonging and love 
And actually, when any of us are pushed to the edges of our humanity, we might say, I wish my mum was here. I wish I still had my children. In other words, it's about realising that people with dementia are not thinking beings. They're not relying on facts, logic, reason and memory. They're relying on heightened emotion. Mm. That's all they trust. So they're looking to us to actually also deliver a feeling-based approach. Got it. Now, I gather when you go to various long-term care homes, you do an initial audit to see, yeah. you know, how tickety-boo or not things are. Yeah. So we're, we're just going to show some viz here of the one in Peel that you did. When you did the audit there, what did you find? I found what I found in most long-term care homes in most countries, that the staff have got lost in process, policies, procedures, mm -hmm. systems. They tap away on computers. They're busy. Mm -hmm. They're working their socks off, but they've lost the plot of why we're all here. And so we measure that, and we measure it by measuring the quality of interactions, minute by minute, between people living there and people working there. And you get a level, uh, and the highest level is level one, exceptional person-centered care. And level 10 is, we need to close. The home was at level nine here in Ontario. Really? And so, other Canadian yeah. homes have all been around level, level seven, eight or nine, off the scale of our tool. The average of our tool is a level six originally. So what did you do to transform it? You take a deep breath, <laughs> because the staff there are obviously naturally very upset. They're decent people. That's why they're there. And it can be really hard to hear this new message. And after the deep breath, and after actually working with them on how they're then feeling, you start to uncover the mask of the home. Well, and we see bright colours are clearly a big part of it, right? And you start to actually see people as they really, really are. Uh, and you start to say, come on, let's bring life, energy, colour, let's bring moments. But it means more than that. You have to transfer the style of leadership, you have to transfer the way in which they're actually constructing the day. You have to get rid of all their menus. No uniforms, no badges, hmm. no staff toilets, all that stuff. You've got to create family. So the staff at these places, it's not that they're bad at their jobs. Not at all. It's, they, they mean well, but they're in a place that doesn't we, allow them to be their best. We've created the cultures that hmm. consume them and turn them into robotic versions of what they really want to be. And so it requires permission. It requires staff to know we can free you up and we'll still meet the regulator's requirements, we'll still meet the health and safety stuff, but first we're going to create care that you and I would say, I want that for somebody I love. And what's been the reaction? It varies initially. It varies initially. You get three groups of people, whether they're staff or families. You get the naturals. They're the people who wear their heart on their sleeve. Mm. They're the people who share their life story with a stranger in a bus queue. And they just run, often racing, and nearly knock me down with their joy and their pleasure, saying, look at this, David. You get staff sometimes who turn themselves so far into butterflies, they've even tattooed themselves with them. You then get the learners in staff or families. They're puzzled. They're like, well, what is this? Because this isn't like my home. This isn't the home my mum had. It wasn't cluttered. It wasn't full of all this stuff, David. And I say, no, but I'm bringing the world in. People Dementia's world is shrinking within a three foot circumference. Mm -hmm. And if that's empty, then we're saying you're a nobody, you're nothing. So what I have to say to staff and families, we're bringing the richness of people's past lives close to help people live it. Then there are fighters. They ring the unions. <laughs> Off the shift, they're saying, oh, it's a fad, it'll go. Uh, I want my uniform, it's my badge of pride. I like the separateness. Mm. And you have to, in the end, take some hard decisions because this requires staff who are emotionally intelligent. When you say take tough decisions, it, it, those folks have to go, I gather? It can, it can involve that, yeah, it can involve that. Some butterfly mm. projects might lose only one or two. Some might lose a significant number of mm. staff first. But what there are thousands of people with heart out there. There are thousands of people with heart out there oh, with who, heart. Want, who want this. I love your accent. My just, your heart. <laughs> <laughs> just every now and then you lose me, but that's okay. Uh, the role of family members in this. Yeah. What role do the family members play? The hardest bit for families is there's two stark choices. And what I always say to families is, the, the most painful choice you've already been living is you come on a visit to a sterile home, you sit on a chair in front of your relative, and the visit doesn't work, and you can't reach the person, and you sit in the car afterwards in the car park and you shed tears. Hmm. You have another choice. You could cross the bridge in their reality, 
learn to accept them as they are, learn not to fix them, not to correct them, not to ask questions, to talk about the doll they say is a baby, mm. to talk about the toolkit that they say they've been at work all day with, and to reach and connect with the person. And you might still sit in the car park and shed a tear, but you'll be left with positive, loving memories. You are very emotional talking about this. How come? Because this is about being vulnerable, isn't it? This is about going right to the edges of being a person. And therefore, all of us have had those moments in our lives, haven't we? And, you know, if you take myself, you know, I had... I lost my father when I was an eight-year-old, a policeman coming up the path. We all know what it is like, and we know our lives can change in a feather. Mm. And I think when you reach staff on, on that basis, when you reach on their emotional life journeys as staff, then you're in with a huge chance that they can connect to people with dementia. This is a... a, a it requires a real re-educating yeah. of family members on the to-dos and not to-dos. Yeah. How up are family members for that? How Actually, open are they? I think most are. In fact, mm -hmm. it's more the opposite. Families say to me, why didn't I know, David? Mm -hmm. Why wasn't I told? Why did I go six years doing the best I could, exhausting myself and getting it all in a fix that was all the wrong way? Mm -hmm. So I think we need in Canada a huge family movement to say it could be different. How does that happen? I think it happens through many channels, politics, media, mm -hmm. things like this, newspapers. It requires advocates, families who, are going to, who often create foundations or charities. It requires the Alzheimer's Society of Canada to politicise and create a movement. It requires many, many people. But actually, given that we're talking about one in three people, given this is bigger than cancer or heart disease, given that we're all going to know someone in our families, it's about actually saying, this is the biggest health issue in Canada for the next 10 years. Actually, we've got stats on this. Can we bring this up now, Sheldon? Here we go. Living with dementia. Of the 564,000 Canadians living with dementia, 41% of them, 230,000, are in the province of Ontario, and that number is expected to grow to a quarter million by the year 2020. Um, this is just not going away, right? This is going to no. be... Bigger and bigger and bigger. I got more stats here. There are 100 butterfly homes in, you told us, five countries, UK, Ireland, US, Australia, here. Fewer than 10 of them are in Canada. Yeah. Seven in Alberta, which was the first to try this model. Ontario is just about to start its second, only its second. Yeah. What do we do about this? I suppose what we're here to say is we're not here to create thousands. Dementia Care Matters is what I describe as a seeding organisation. We're here to see the messages that this works. But I think once actually people see it, uh, like when they saw it in the Toronto Star on the Fix and they saw the film there, mm. when people see it, it's hard if people don't know what it looks, sounds or feels like. But once the message goes out there, this is actually the transformation. This is what it could be like. People with dementia may live a number of years, but you can really, really reach someone. You have to, you, I mean, teaching family members, teaching staff to be more empathetic is a tough go, right? Because for years yeah. and years, we've just sort of been accustomed to arguing with these people who've got these emotional pro mental problems. And I think it's about our own detachment in society. Mm -hmm. I think it's a bigger issue than dementia. I think we have to create more connected society again. I, I use the words, you know, the difference between being a detached professional and an attached professional. I was trained to be detached. I was told I was over-emotional. I shouldn't cry with the patients. What are you thinking, David? Getting on a bed and cradling someone. Mm. And I learnt it. And I learnt it for many years until my gut started to say, but look at then what it delivers detached, faceless, task-based care. So I think we need to really empower society to say, come on, none of us live well with a detachment. We all want some attachment in our life, whether it's to a pet, a baby, a next door neighbor, we need attachment. And when you try teaching that to staff members, how does that go over? Initially, there's anxiety. Initially, there's, there, there's concern about where's this going. People say, you know, will you create an emotional tsunami in workplaces? Mm. But what it does is free people up. And when staff start to tell their emotional journeys, which everyone has, you reach the whole common humanity between us all. I don't have to tell you, with, with I mean, with teachers here nowadays, doctors, nurses, everybody is taught nowadays, don't get too familiar 
with your students, with your patients, you know, the, you know, false accusations can come back at you. And there's a lot of concern ab out there, right, about getting too close to students or patients. Yeah. How do you overcome that kind of understandable skepticism? I think when you see the outcome, hmm. you know, when you see uh, a person with dementia who has got trapped in what is described as behaviours, and of course it's not behaviours, mm. and they're in their room and they're sh shrinking inwards, and then you discover that they actually used to cut fish off the Atlantic coast, mm. that they love Highland music, that you actually find things in their life story and you recreate it, and you see that woman living outside of her bedroom suddenly with joy, mm. then you'd say, why wouldn't you want this? Why wouldn't you? OK, let's talk turkey. You ready? All right. What does it cost to take a nursing home or a long-term care facility yeah. that used to do things the old way yeah. and transform it to the way you want it done? Yeah. It costs uh, 100,000 Canadian dollars for the first year. We're only, we only go in for one year and then we're there to leave it as sustainable. Uh, and that's to pay, obviously, for all the leadership change, all the environmental change, all the emotional intelligence training of the staff, the many tools they use to assess well-being. But after a year, 66% less falls, 40 to 70% less food wastage, hmm. reductions in hospital admissions, the stats go on and on. So it easily pays for itself. In other words, within 18 months, hmm. just, just try and put cost to all of those figures. In the first years, I wanted people to want this from heart. I don't really want to sell it on business, but it can be sold. This is good business sense as well. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you know, that since we're talking about the province of Ontario here, we have a new government just in place over the last few months, yep. and their immediate goal, they have an enormous budget deficit, their immediate goal is to find billions upon billions of dollars in efficiency, savings, cuts, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they may not be open to an argument that pay me a little more now and you're going to save money down the road. And I'm sure that's mm. the case for governments all over the world, right? Yeah. Uh, up, you know, pay me now, savings down the road. They can't worry about down the road. They're worried about what's in front of their noses today. Mm. So what, what argument can you make to that? Number one, this isn't uh, a two-year fix, is it? We're talking the next 25 years. Hmm. Uh, secondly, you know, I met a care provider this week who talked about you know, the government here in Ontario uh, increasing the numbers of beds and that they want them built in 32-bed units, another banned word. I've never lived in a unit. <laughs> what, but, what should we say? Uh, home. Homes. Just right. home okay. or neighbourhood or right. community. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to go home to live with 31 other people tonight. And even if you did, you've enough cognitive grasp to work your way through how to be, live and be with 31 people. Mm. Whereas what I'm saying is, yes, we have to build large scale. We need to build, you know, 100, 120 place homes, but they can be built as 12 10 bedded houses. Uh, and it doesn't cost more. And actually, if you then got people living in matched houses at a similar point of dementia, what happens is you save loads of money. The drugs cost a fortune that you're no longer using. Mm -hmm. You save on staff retention. There are many, you save even on infection rates. And I used to think, how does this, what people think is soft, fluffy butterfly model, save on infection rates? But think about it. If, you're, if you've got low mood, low self-esteem, low well-being, you're much more open to all the infections that are around in the world. Mm, right. Because your body's immune system is it lowered. Right. Let's finish up on this, David. If, if transforming our long-term care facilities, homes, sorry, to butterfly homes doesn't happen. Where does that leave dementia care here, around the world, going forward? It leaves it in the 19th century. It leaves it in asylums. It leaves it in a society that would look back on us in another 30, 40 years time and say, what on earth was, were they doing? In a society of greed, in a society that actually was not prepared to care for the, its elders, the people who defended each country, who stood through poverty, who enabled us to live the lives we've lead, it would be a case of shame on you. We can do better. We can. We're so grateful that you could spare so much time for us at TVO tonight. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. That's you. Dr. David Shear. He's the founder of Dementia Care Matters and the Butterfly Homes, which we've heard so much about tonight. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.